So if we are all mic'd up, we can um, get going. Good evening, welcome to this evening's forum on the United Nations Search for Peace, as seen from a very particular vantage point, namely three special representatives of the Secretary General. My name is John Ruggie, Kirkpatrick Professor of International Affairs here at the Kennedy School as of a year ago, and prior to that, Assistant Secretary General in Kofi Annan's office uh, in New York. Our guests this evening are Jacques Klein, who serves as SRSG, as these folks are fondly known, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Dr. Bernard Kushner, who held the post in Kosovo, and James Lemoyne, Special Advisor to the Secretary General on International Assistance to Colombia. One lesson about um, SRSGs that I learned on my job in New York is that they may well have the most difficult job in the entire world. They are responsible for what in the United States is sometimes dismissively known as nation building, and yet they control few, if any, of the tools required to perform their mission. The Security Council decides their mandate, but they have to struggle daily with the inevitable ambiguities and contradictions. They are called upon to secure law and order, but can command no troops, and have to rely on civilian police that are recruited literally one at a time from different national, state, and local jurisdictions. They have to cope with the bombardment of demands from UN headquarters, national capitals, multilateral and bilateral aid agencies, as well as NGOs, all of which have their particular agendas and the totality of which rarely adds up. And all of that is before they ever face the tough and sometimes brutal facts on the ground. Weak or non-existent institutions, factional conflict driven by greed and grievance, destroyed economies and physical infrastructure, and the criminal networks that are parasitic on conflict zones, among other challenges. The surprise is that the system ever works. In fact, it works more often than is generally realized. We will learn how from our guests tonight. Let me say at the outset that all three exemplify the extraordinary skills and personal commitment that the job requires. Jacques Klein, as I indicated, is currently Special Representative of the UN Secretary General to Bosnia-Herzegovina, a position he's held since August 1999. He previously served as a very successful transitional administrator for Eastern Slavonia. He's a career member of the US Foreign Service, and has also served in the Pentagon uh, and other assignments. He received undergraduate and graduate degrees in history, has done postgraduate work in international politics, and I'm told, Jack, you were here at the Kennedy School's executive program in security policy back in 1989, and that, of course, explains your success. <laughs> Dr. Bernard Kushner was head of the UN interim administration mission in Kosovo from July 1999 to January 2001. He founded Médecins Sans Frontières, a Paris-based nonprofit humanitarian organization made up of voluntary medical personnel who contribute their time and expertise in situations of emergency or inadequate medical care throughout the developing world, an organization that has won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's played an important role in the French political scene for the past 20 years holding a number of ministerial positions, most recently Minister of Health. He's also a renowned author and a recipient of several human rights awards. And during his UN service in Kosovo, I know from personal experience, his inventiveness kept the Office of Legal Affairs hopping and, so <laughs> and sometimes hopping mad. <laughs> He said so. <laughs> well done, well done, Bernard. James Lemoyne has served in his current job as Special Advisor to the Secretary General in Colombia since January 2002, 
He previously was Deputy Special Advisor to Colombia, to Jan Egland. He's also served as Chief Political Advisor to the United Nations Development Program in Latin America, and has worked in peace processes, complex emergencies, and peace building for the past 20 years in places including Nicaragua, El Salvador, Haiti, the former Yugoslavia, Northern Ireland, Guatemala, and Colombia. When will you come to teach at Kennedy School? When you become a complex zone. Okay, will I become a conflict zone? Or when the Kennedy School does, let's hope that doesn't happen. Before joining the United Nations, Mr. Lemoyne was a senior foreign correspondent and foreign policy analyst, serving among, uh, in among other capacities as the bureau chief of the New York Times. Um, he's a US citizen, born in Germany, raised in Europe, Latin America, and the United States, and studied at Harvard, Oxford, and the London School of Economics. Jacques, seven minutes for your opening remarks, and then we'll move across. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, whatever I know, whatever I learned, whatever I've been able to do, I attribute to what I learned in these exalted halls. Now, having headed two UN missions, I think we need to start with the construct of what is the United Nations, how does the mandate occur, how does that evolve? Now, we all know the United Nations is not some amorphous construct. It's all of us in this room. It's 192 countries now, I think, with East Timor and Switzerland. The General Assembly gives to the Security Council plenipotentiary powers, that is, the power to declare war and peace. The Security Council, five permanent members and 10 rotating members, have that authority. Now, let's address a problem. There is a fire somewhere and the world is burning. The fire cannot be dealt with locally. There are neither enough fire trucks or firemen. And someone decides this issue should be given to the Security Council. The Security Council are the same people who could not solve the problem out there, which then makes one wonder what makes you think they can solve it here. But let's assume now they're seized with the issue, and that's one of our favorite words. We're seized with the issue. And the debate begins. And my colleague on my left here says, there's a fire burning in my part of the world. I want something done about it. I need help and assistance immediately. I, on the other side of the room, say to my assistant, do we have any buildings insured in that part of the world? And the answer is no. And therefore, my interest diminishes immediately. But he insists, pounds on the table. I helped you last year. You helped me this year. Then we begin the hard struggle. You have a fire, you need fire trucks. How many fire trucks do you think we need? Two? Maybe five, but only three with water. That's what we call the mandate. <laughs> so I would say to you, basically, the whole issue is mandate. Tell me what my mandate is. Tell me what you want me to do. Then give me the resources to do it, and we will do the job for you. But with vague amorphous man uh, mandates, as Bernard, I'm sure, will address, with lack of clear direction, uh, how am I supposed to do my job? Now, once we have the mandate, you've given it to me now, you go to Eastern Savonia and do this and this. Now, where do I find the troops? I have a Rolodex. I start calling people. Can you provide one battalion mechanized infantry by 15 April? Can you, can you, can you? Then I need an engineering battalion, a helicopter squadron. I have to go around the world. These aren't available. I have to shop for them. And many nations are forthcoming and helpful. Then I need civilian policemen, six, 700 of them. Where do I find those? And then I need my own civil affairs cadre. Now, you may be the SRSG, but I have no staff. I need a deputy, a head of civil affairs, et cetera, et cetera, whom I have to recruit somewhere. And you want me to be in place within 60 or 90 days, already carrying out whatever mandate you gave me. Those are the structural problems that you have before you be even begin to address the local problems of dealing with the mandate they gave you. So I hope we'll get into that a little bit. Then we can talk about the politics and the other dimensions. Thank you very much, Bernard Kushner. So after all, just coming to the place, arriving to the place, it was Kosovo. And Kosovo, we have heard about. And Kosovo, we uh, were aware about the victims. The victims were the Kosovar Albanians. Is, was it clear? Yes, apparently it was clear. Arriving there without anything but some 45 military people coming from NATO and on under the UN supervision, we discovered that we only have to protect the people who are not supposed to be protected. That is to say the Serbs. 
because they were the people threatened, the reminding Serbs, and we were not ready for that. And we were not ready because usually the mandate, the famous mandate, was particularly unclear with the 1244 resolution. But we had to rebuild, restore, set up the whole state. It was not a nation, but everything from the garbage problem to the constitution. From the electric power, the power stations, to the water and the health system and the judiciary system, everything. Like, of course, a government must do it. But we had no government, so we have to set up the government. We'll see after. The main thing, certainly when we left, Kosovo was in a better condition than when we came in, first. Second, it was a fantastically tiring, exhausting day and night work but we felt like if we were useful, which was not exactly the same thing coming back to my country as a member of the government. <laughs> Don't laugh. Very unfair, because they are not French. Well, okay. <laughs> but third point, we were more or less not happy, but we were, we felt, as I told you, that we were useful for the people. <coughs> But to be useful for the people, it was really to insist day by day, hour by hour, to involve them in their own affairs, to get them on board, not to judge or to rule the country or the Kosovo or the region like if you were a former colonialist paratrooper. You have to ins I have to insist on that. You have to get them on board. And I think that more or less it has been done. But last word, it was impossible to achieve the goal between, because inside the 1244 resolution there was no goal, no clarity, no aim, no guideline, nothing but keep quiet. And for the moment it has been done. There is no war and less victims than before. James Lemoyne. Thank you. Well, I've been asked to speak about what happens after people like Klein and Bernard Kushner pick up and, and leave, which is when peacekeeping operations end or peace enforcement and a longer process of peace building begins. And I'm going to speak a little bit more to policy level. What's really happened since the Cold War ended in 1989 is that the United Nations for the first time has been asked to become an effective international actor in conflict resolution and peace building. It's a new world and a new demand for which the UN was not equipped, not prepared, not financed, and not mandated properly. A, it's learning. It's been 13 years of on-the-job training, but it's a tough process. And in the gamut of peace operations, peace enforcement, armed troops, forcing people to stop fighting, peacekeeping, maintaining that peace, peace uh, making, encouraging accords, a, a verification and, and facilitation, and peace building creating the institutions, the structures, the consensus to let societies begin to govern themselves. Of those, they're all hard. Peace building may be the toughest, and the one where we've had least success, and where one could argue very few people have had success. Professor Ruggie used the word nation building earlier, a popular word in the 50s and 60s, not a popular word among some governments in the 80s and 90s because it's so hard to do. The um, other part of it is the UN has no clear mandate in the Charter for Peace Building. It's a new area, and um, as a consequence, there are very important member states who are not very supportive of peace building. They see it as giving the UN a slightly interventionist capacity, violates national sovereignty, makes it overly active in ways that they don't want. They want a clear capacity through General Assembly resolutions and the Security Council to control where the UN gets active. As a consequence, in a sense, we're slightly handicapped. Secondly, or thirdly, or fourthly, there's a huge variety, as these guys demonstrate, and what I'm doing now demonstrate, of UN missions, types of peace building. Let's think about it. You have peacekeeping missions mandated by the Security Council, which each of them have worked in, where you have a big troop presence, big international support, lots of money, right out of the UN budget. Fairly easy to do, even though the circumstances are hard because you have muscle. Then you have Department of Political Affairs, DPA, General Assembly, political missions, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Somalia, uh, Guinea-Bissau, what I'm doing in Colombia. Those are good offices missions or political missions with very little muscle. 
lots more uh, attempt to convince and to and to 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 get cooperation, but but often with very few levers. Then you have major crisis countries, the vast majority in which there's no UN presence at all at a political level. All this there is the UN country team, UNICEF, UNDP, being asked to do the most incredibly complex work you can imagine. Sudan, uh, Algeria, Sri Lanka. Um, we're not equipped to do it. The um, huge difference in missions in which you have active opposition, the locals want it, you have a, a conflict continuing, you have peace accords that can be verified or no, or no, or no peace accords. I'm trying to say that it's, it's a very, very complex scenario. On top of that, <clears throat> I can promise you there's never enough time, there's never enough money, there's never enough political clout, there's never enough UN capacity, there's never enough international backing, there's never enough local capacity, and we'll always leave too soon to get the job done. One could argue that there are only two great successes in international uh, efforts to re rebuild countries in the century, Germany and Japan. Billions and billions and billions of dollars occupation, 25 years of international commitment. Can you imagine what would have happened in Germany and Japan if the international community, as it did in Somalia, as it did in Nicaragua, as it did in Haiti, as it did in Rwanda, just got up and left after two years in 1947? That's what we face. On top of that, the UN in every one of these cases is going to face at least three issues that are the toughest nuts to crack. Disarming, demobilization, and reintegration of combatants, dealing with refugees and internally displaced population, and rule of law. And by rule of law, I mean the gamut. I mean penal reform, judicial reform, um, the laws themselves, creating a police force, a culture of rule of law, a respect for human rights. These are unbelievably difficult things to do for most societies. Imagine doing it to a war-torn society and the UN being asked to do it. One can conservatively argue it will take at least 10 years. We seldom have it. Secondly, the UN has no transition mechanism. These guys eventually are going to leave Kosovo and, and Bosnia, and then who takes over? Under the Brahimi process, which is UN reform, DPKO peacekeeping was given 200 new posts, a lot of muscle. The other arms of the UN, DPA, the system itself, UNDP, et cetera, were given almost nothing. Yet they're gonna be the ones who are asked to step in and take on all of those tasks. A country that I won't mention by name, but that I worked in for a long time, I was there when the transition happened. The DPK mission left, and I and others were asked to keep training the police force. It was impossible. I mean, we were dealing with cocaine, assassinations, presidential guards killing people. We had no bodyguards. We didn't have peacekeepers. And it collapsed. We couldn't do it. That transition mechanism doesn't exist, and it has to be built. And it's, it's going to be tough to do it. I'm running on to my seven minutes, and I don't want to make Professor Ruggie unhappy. I'll end like this. I've been working uh, first as a foreign correspondent for almost 14 years and now for the UN for 11 in 14 wars and, and crises. Uh, I've seen tens of thousands of people killed, including some of my best friends. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people displaced and made refugees, tens of thousands raped and tortured. Um, I don't think that it's Pollyannish or touchy-feely to say that if we don't get this area of peace building the sustainability of ending conflict and rebuilding societies right or better, we stand a very good chance of the future being worse rather than better, as unimaginable as that is, in a century that's been as horrific as this one. Thank you. Thank you to all three for very, very thought-provoking opening statements. Let me move on now to ask um, a few questions to get the conversation going. Jacques, can I begin with you? The challenge that James Lemoyne has just laid out, the United States often, and particularly in the current administration, is not always at the forefront of countries wanting to build the capacity internationally to do the sorts of things that James Lemoyne has just suggested need to be done. In your experience as a uh, foreign service officer, a long-term participant and observer in U.S. foreign policy and defense policy, why is that and what are the conditions under which it might change? I don't think it's necessarily going to change. I think there's just a reticence to engage. It's not only in the United States. I find it also in Western Europe. You know, as one Western Europe foreign minister said, we don't wear short pants. Well, short pants means missions outside of Europe. So I don't think this is necessarily unusual. 
Um, I would tell you this, I'm not as pessimistic as, uh, as Jim is. We've had successful missions, and Eastern Slavonia was one. In other words, we did exactly what he said we needed to do. We did a transitional administration, we reintegrated the region, we disarmed, we demined, we gave the Serbs their hope for a future in Croatia, and it actually worked. It worked so well that no one knows about it. And that is one of the tragedies of success. Because the missions that were successful don't receive the publicity. The media focuses on the negative. In Bosnia Herzegovina, it will also be a success. By that I mean we've taken 40,000 policemen down to 20,000. We vetted them, we trained them, human rights, forensics, traffic management, crime scene investigation. We've given them $16 million worth of equipment. We built two police academies. We created a state border service in a country that had no defined territorial integrity. That was the mandate, and that mandate will be finished by this December. <coughs> so I'm not necessarily as convinced as he is that UN missions have not been successful or that we don't know how to do this. My staff is superb. I have 95 nationalities in my mission. My chief of staff is Pakistani, my protocol officer is Iraqi, my deputy is a Syrian Armenian, my administrator is a German, my political advisor is a Russian. The United Nations has an enormous cadre of people, enormous talent to do this. In fact, we moved in troops, equipment, in a five or six, uh, six week period that would have been a challenge for any Western Europe mil military organization. And I don't think they could have done it as well. Bernard, let me ask you a question. Um, Lakhtar Brahimi, the uh, SRSG in Afghanistan, was recently here at Harvard for an event, and he was asked, what would you say if Kofi Annan called you and sent you to Iraq as SRSG in a post-war situation? And without hesitating, Brahimi said, I would say, send someone else. If you got that call, send me. what would you say? Send me. And what would the mission be, and <laughs> what would you think the prospects would That's be? That's the problem. <laughs> but let me tell you first that I'm in complete agreement with uh, Jacques, and not for the first time. I, I come back to your mm -hmm. question on Iraq, of course. Um, things have changed. This is very difficult. Not only for us, I mean physically, for our staff, for the fantastic efforts. Uh, we are obliged to, 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 to offer to the people. But if you are looking back five years ago, 10 years ago, 14 years ago, or before the Second World War, it was just impossible to imagine that a sort of international body represented by the UN now was in charge of the suffering of the others. You didn't get any right to protect any minority suffering of any massacre or eventually genocide impossible just to think about and it has changed for several reasons first NGOs sorry to say that the first people to start crossing the border were NGOs volunteer without pay people because of their ethic offering the hand. The doctors, it was easier because they had some particular specific job to do. But not only the doctors, the first were Amnesty International, then Doctor Without Border, then the others. And we forced the public opinion, not the official, not the diplomat, not the politician, the public opinion, to react against the massacre of the minorities on the other side of a border. So human rights were not part of the international body of law. Humanitarian law, yes, just to get more sweet uh, the wars. And this is very, very important, Geneva Convention, etc. But no thing in relation with human rights. Now, above the fantastically important sovereignty of state, you have the human rights. And we started UN bodies with some ally to protect the minority. Oh, sometimes we felt, remember Rwanda. It was a certain failure. We, were, we came back. I was in Rwanda. I can tell you the story. But this was unimaginable. So this is a great success of not only the international body of uh, law and organization and a political body of the UN, but of the international consciousness. And Kosovo is part of that and Eastern Slavonia and Colombia, really Jacques, I know, 
We had a tremendous effort, and there is a double standard. What about Tibet? What about Chechnya, etc.? We know. But this is better than before, believe me. Going back to Iraq, you know the position of my country is not exactly the position of the, of the American administration. And for the first time, I'm in agreement with my diplomats. <laughs> So I think that we have to go anywhere, we have to go through the Security Council. And my personal feeling is that I don't understand the timing of Mr. Bush. Uh, or I understand pretty well, and this is not a, an international timing, but eventually an internal timing. But I don't want to be unfair. I have no doubt, I have no doubt at all Mr. Saddam Hussein is not supported by the Iraqi people. I know that since years and years. Not only the Kurdish, not the Shahid. I know this is uh, not my friend. And not only that, but uh, I've been working there, and uh, I remember all the assassination and the torture, and you know that 200,000 people did disappeared. Iraqi people. So um, no doubt it must be one of these days punished. We need an hand. But now, I'm not so sure. Now, in the middle of this particular tension after uh, 11th of September and the way, not the Muslim world, some particular extremists, but also the Muslim world will react, I don't think that this is the good moment. That's all. But I'm absolutely ready to go to Iraq. It will be difficult, but uh, it will be useful. Uh, you want to go to Iraq too? Yeah, I know. I'd go with him, absolutely. <laughs> well, it will be worse. I know. To Iraq without Jack. I mean, uh... we could do this together. <laughs> now, you see, in the old days, it was simple. You had a bipolar world. The question is, when do you engage militarily? There was never a doubt. Soviet Union attacks, etc. You engage. Then there's a second echelon, which is you're not directly threatened. That is, Chicago or Kansas aren't threatened, but your allies are threatened. Our NATO structure, our friends. Do you engage? Yes. But then there's the third one, and that's the hard one. There's a problem out there, like Rwanda, in which we have no national security interest. There's none. There's no conceivable way you can make the argument. But what is happening is so egregiously wrong, so sickening from a perspective of any decency, that how can you stand by and do nothing? But how do you harness a nation to accept that thesis? What we're talking about is high noon. Yeah. I'm the marshal. I've given up the office. I'm no longer involved in this. But no one else in town is willing to do it. Everyone says they'll help me, but they won't. A lot of misinformation. The young kid who wants to help me can't shoot. The sheriff is drunk and has arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. Then who does it? Do I do it? And how do I persuade others that this is the right thing to do? When it means possible loss of life. That's the hard one. How do you explain to the mother in Kansas that there's something egregiously wrong here in the world, that there's a dictator who's slaughtering people, and someone has to stop it, and there's no other adult supervision around? That's your dilemma, and that's a very difficult one to deal with. Jim, may I ask uh, you a somewhat different question? Um, one of the central issues that concerns the, uh, the project on justice in times of transition, one of the main sponsors of this evening's event, um, is how to reconcile the sometimes conflicting demands of peace and justice. You've observed these situations for many years. What have you learned about how to reconcile um, these two, how to manage this dilemma? Thank you. Um, I'm a maximalist, but um, uh, there are arguments on both sides. My experience, the first peace process where the UN really got involved in this issue, I think I'm right in saying, was El Salvador. And uh, in El Salvador, we formed a truth commission to look into the abuses of the past. That, that commission was mandated to name names. Um, we formed a commission to purify the armed forces. Uh, that commission was mandated to kick people out of the armed forces. Um, we kicked 103 officers out of the Salvadoran army, including the entire high command. And we prescribed several Salvadoran political leaders, including three guerrilla commanders, from public life for 10 years through the truth commission and clarified horrific abuses by both sides, and in fact, all sides. We were told repeatedly, as we did that in El Salvador, that it wouldn't work, that Chile had had a truth commission and had not named names because it would be too divisive, that Argentina had had a kind of commission that hadn't gotten anywhere, and <clears throat> this was the way to have peace in Argentina because there'd be a coup d'etat. 
in El Salvador we pushed hard, and the fact is it worked. Salvadorans came to terms with the horrific uh, abuses that they inflicted on themselves and had inflicted upon them, and in fact, a process of national healing occurred. We now have multiple, multiple experiences of countries that have had amnesties, truth commissions, no truth commissions, name names, not name names, confessed, the South African model, etc. Um, countries that have had no truth commissions have done badly. Haiti had no truth commission. Nicaragua had no truth commission. And they're still at each other's throats about who did what to whom. I'm for truth commissions. However, uh, these are issues that have got to be argued through locally. Um, there are people, there are places where it will absolutely not be accepted and the UN won't be able to impose it, number one. Number two, there are places where the concept of truth and reconciliation is different. Societies where the idea of individual retribution or reconciliation is not as important as cultural or social or group reconciliation or reintegration or restorative justice. I mean, there are cultural standards here one has to be aware of. One isn't necessarily the prosecutor sending somebody to jail for life, whereas in a, a particular society in Africa, maybe what this, people are more interested in is simply getting that person back into society. Having said that, my experience is that a stronger position works. A, as, as Kushner has said, and he's fought his entire life for it, we've entered a new world, one in which human rights and the idea that people can get away with mass murder and nobody has a right to say anything, it's over. It should be over. We should fight for that principle and maintain it. The SG has been very outspoken on this and paid a price for it. And there are places where we haven't done it, and frankly, it's shame on all of us. I don't agree with Jacques and Bernard as much as I respect them. They work in the Rolls Royce of UN missions. To compare what happened in Slovenia, <laughs> particularly Jacques, um, <laughs> this one. <laughs> These are missions that have incredible amounts of money. White people are dying in Europe, so Europe and the United States care. I'm being very blunt, but let's be honest. 800,000 people were murdered in Rwanda. We were prohibited from using the word genocide. It makes me very angry. It was a disgusting moment in international relations. Over a million people have died in the Congo. Where are all the troops? Kosovo and Macedonia, the UN spends $5,000, or damn near, per capita. We spend $13 in Burundi. Why? Answer the question yourselves. These are Rolls-Royce missions. Sure, you give me 50,000 peacekeepers. You give me multi-million dollars. You give me the commitment of every European government in the Bush administration or an American administration. You know what? I can produce real results for you. Come to Haiti. Come to Afghanistan when it's not popular. The UN spent 12 years in Afghanistan as everybody walked away, and that place was decimated because the United States and China and Russia and Pakistan and lots of others got involved there and settled their disputes and destroyed that place. And for 12 years, the UN people there were alone. And they said, hell is going to break loose here. And it took two towers going down for somebody to care. I'm sorry to be blunt about this. I don't mean to be pessimistic. I mean to be realistic. I absolutely believe in the UN. I totally agree with what Jacques and Bernard have said. Unbelievable people under incredible circumstances doing remarkable things. But it's damn tough. It isn't just, it isn't just Rwanda and the Congo. In Bosnia, Herzegovina, Radovan Karadzic is still loose. That's seven years after Dayton. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? This is a man who was personally responsible and a key perpetrator in the deaths of some 230,000 people. What it means to me is that no matter what else we say about Bosnia as a governor, how positive or successful we think it may be, it will be a failure until he's arrested. Why? What it demonstrates is the impotence of the West in the face of evil and it is lack of political will and capitals. Mm. You know, now, when I meet the mothers of Srebrenica and they talk to me about this, what do I say? I have an unarmed police force. We have no executive mandate. We can't arrest anyone. But there are other people there who have mandates, who have the weapons, who should be doing this. Because as long as courage is just free, it basically emboldens hardline Serbs to resist, it makes moderate Serbs cautious about dealing with us, and it undermines any construct of reconciliation in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Why he's still free, I can't explain to you, except lack of political will. Why Mladic is still free in Belgrade, the same reasons. But those are the things that I think are way beyond our power and scope. Mm. But it shows you the enormous political dilemma up here, where you cannot get consensus. Uh, by the political leadership on what to do. And indeed, I think in the Balkans, and Bernard and I agree on this, 
if I, if I go to a foreign minister and brief them on the Balkans, when I'm all through, I say to Mr. Minister, please tell me, how do you see this part of South Central Europe in 2010? And I get a long blank stare, <laughs> which means we tempo-centrically respond to crises without having thought through policy, Kosovo, Montenegro, Macedonia, etc. I was born in Alsace in eastern France, and we have an old proverb which says, if you start out and you don't know where you're going, you're probably going to wind up somewhere else. And consistently, we wind up somewhere else, because we've never thought these things through. Mm. Are there any comments on the dilemma of peace versus justice? Well, it depends. Uh, blunt to blunt, I have to be sincere with you. Easy to dream, and easy to to do and to change the reality, because uh, UN, Jack, is made of nations. Mm -hmm. And nations are, by essence, selfish, in a way, because they have their own interest. And we have to change this world. This is just the beginning. We are working for a global world, and we are working certainly for a sort of, let me, we are just at the beginning, the beginning of the whispering of a global government. But this is what we are talking about. In fact, for the moment, this is not true. We have all this particular national interest in Balkan. You know that the position of my country is not the same that the German. That was not the same. But step by step, it goes to the same position. And this is very, I'm very optimist on that. But this is true for Karacic. This is true for Burundi. I was working in Burundi. I was during the, the, the genocide. And I don't hesitate, of course, to call it a genocide. But you know, I was there with the poor General Romeo Dallaire, mm -hmm. who was completely isolated, my friend Dallaire. And I was there, I was not, no longer a member of the French government, I was just a, a, a sort of coming back of my former uh, volunteer, uh, volunteerness doctor, etc. And we tried to phone to the people, and I've been sent by Boutros Ghali in case of, etc. But step by step, we discovered after all the phone call that nobody was ready to come. Oh, yes, oh, I'm very sorry, but my soldier was a bit far. Yes, well, well, in two months. Meanwhile, they were killing the people. Nobody reacted. And I'm sorry to say that the only one, badly or not, reacting was the French. And after this, they have been accused to facilitate the, 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 the exit of the criminal, etc. I don't want to enter in that. But we try. My country, I'm sure, but I, because I came back from Rwanda to push in that direction. Nobody wanted. Why? And Burundi, why? Because there is no national interest, no petrol, no strategic interest. Don't be childish. Be romantic, if you like. But change your country. Because if you have no support from your public opinion for a politician, you cannot tell to the people, unemployed people or poor people in your country, we have to help the others so far. So we have really to set up a consciousness, a new consciousness of the world. That's our task, because we have it. But you know, back, I know for Jack, and I'm sure for the other Jack, coming back to your country is really always painful. Because from far, and you are so exhausted, and etc., and after years, you have to come back to your fantastic country of France. But the people, they don't care about what you have done. They even don't know where it was. <laughs> Kosovo is part of Africa. No, this is okay. <laughs> and you are very disappointed by your people. Why? Not because they are disappointing, because the politicians are. Because to be elected, you cannot, two things, promise more taxes, difficult. You will not be elected. That's why I've never been. And second, promise to help the African and Burundes and the Rwandes and not the French. So this is the reality. So I'm very optimistic, because before, you know, very shortly, when I founded Doctor Without Border, it was not against the Red Cross, but I, I had in mind the way they conduct their efforts during the Second World War, and they didn't want to denounce the extermination camps and etc. And as we were facing in Biafra the same mass murder, not for the same reason, etc., but we wanted to speak, and we decided to speak. You know that when you are part of a, a, a Red Cross mission, you have to sign the declaration in order not to be a witness of anything, secret, unacceptable in the modern time. You must be impartial, but not neutral. Neutrality is the worst thing in the world. Neutrality is always to be on the good side of the 
powerful people. Yes, but so it was in two terms very easy to say. I had one. <laughs> very easy. At the beginning, you were asking the people, oh, my dear uh, prime minister or president, very often he was a dictator. Do I have the right, do you allow me, to go on the other side of the border to treat your poor victims? Yes or no? If they have said yes, okay, you are crossing the border. But the Red Cross always demand the clearance. Second step, doctor without border. Yes, we act like that. We ask the people, oh my dear dictator, was it possible to treat you wounded people? Yes or no? He said yes, we were coming. He said no, we were coming. <laughs> A bit different. And now, with the UN system, we are on the way to tell to the dictators, because with democracy it happens also, but less, to say, you have no right to assassinate your minority. By advance, the right to intervene or the necessity to protect, as you said with uh, Garrett Evans and, and Mohamed Sanoun, is now something before the crisis, by prevention, by definition, but it's uneasy to, to do and easy to say. So, my dear dictator, is it possible you have no right to kill your people even hidden behind your borders? And this is something very different. A lot must be done, but this is not bad. Jim, final word from you, then we want to open it up for Q&A. Yes, I said earlier that uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the argument between truth and um, rather peace and justice that I was a maximalist, and the peace processes I've worked on, I have been. I've always argued for as strong a role as we can take in establishing what happened and punishing or at least naming those who did it. But I want to be very clear. It's a real dilemma, and it goes beyond nation states. Uh, most of the people that I've either negotiated with or reintegrated in society or attempted to get to talk to each other again are mass murderers. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people uh, that I have negotiated with um, and you know, attempted to, to stop shooting each other, one of the first questions they ask me is, what's going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. Why should I stop shooting people? Because I'm going to get shot. I remember a key moment in the uh, El Salvador process when I was sitting down with one of the absolutely toughest guerrilla leaders, a man who said to me that he personally killed 2,000 people in his life. And um, his great, great fear was going to bed without his AK-47 and his hand grenade because he'd never slept without one for 21 years. And he said, I literally cannot sleep without one. I don't sleep. And uh, he, I think, spent five years sleeping with a stick and an apple because he had to have something next to him. That is a physical statement of what these people are doing in transition. Why do I say it? Would I rather not have to uh, negotiate with mass murderers? Would I rather, as Bernard has said, be able to condemn them, put them in jail? Sure I would. But we're very practical. Uh, I think, bottom line, we always tend to believe if we can get a peace accord and get these people to stop killing each other, it's better to do that than in the name of absolute justice risk prolonging this thing indefinitely because they'll never come in from the cold. Is it pretty to do? No. Uh, Bismarck said those who respect sausages and laws should not be present while either are being made. <laughs> Peace accords are a bit like that. And I can say um, in this confessional moment that I think a problem of what we do, but I don't know a way out of it, is that we privilege the violent and the armed because they're the ones we're trying to get to disarm. They're the ones who tend to be at the table with us. And we underprivilege their victims, the survivors, and the great mass of suffering mere mortals who we tend to do very little for because mm. we have so focused on getting these people disarmed and out. It's, it's, it's a difficult trade-off. Thank you very much. We'll turn now to um, some Q&A from the floor. Um, please uh, identify yourselves, keep your questions brief and make sure it is a question. I would like to uh, make sure that Harvard students get at least the first round of questions. So as you line up, um, sort yourselves out, please. Um, also, um, because of the extremely difficult and discreet nature of the work that uh, James Lemoyne is currently engaged in, we've agreed as part of the ground rules for tonight that he will not respond and not be asked to respond to questions concerning the situation in Colombia. Let's begin over here. There, oh, we stole your mic, says, so we did. Let's jump over here and 
start with you. Um, hi, my name is Makiko. I'm a, a Master of Public Policy student at Kennedy School. I myself spent a year working for the UN Transitional Administration in East Timor, and I do actually share the dilemmas and whatnot. But my question um, for all three of you would be, um, the peace building is a very difficult process, very time consuming and very costly. So my, um, how do you think the UN can actually mobilize, go in and prevent the crisis before it's too late, before the gross gen human rights violation has taken place? I think it goes back to the question of state sovereignty and the human rights violation, but if you have any ideas. Prevention, remember what I said about the Security Council, you know. Uh, how do you persuade the Security Council to take preventive steps uh, when they don't quite believe that a cataclysm will happen? In other words, you're always hoping that somehow negotiation, dialogue, uh, this endless, endless, endless kind of uh, discussion will somehow resolve it. When you can see it coming, you know, you the practitioner, you the surgeon have analyzed the problem, and you can see the disease progressing, and you know surgery needs to be done. But by the way, the nature of the council is structured, I don't see them jumping in in a prevention mode, a la Rwanda, or even Kosovo, or anywhere else. It's just very difficult to motivate them to do that. It's after there's been a crisis and catharsis where you, the media, the NGOs, start putting pressure on governments and say, damn it, we want something done. What's happening here is egregious, and you can't let it go on. Only then, I think, do they begin to take it seriously. You want to add? Um... Well, I want to, to teach here in Kennedy School to be as clever as Jack. <laughs> if it's possible. It's possible I'm coming. Well, I'm not in, in agreement with uh, Jacques. Of course, this is the way it works now. But in between us, we must change this way. We need absolutely to go on prevention. And you know, it's always the same thing. And the comparison in between international policy and uh, public health is absolutely crucial. That's why Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctor Without Borders, was part of policy, politics, of course. We are, you are always accused to be a politician if you are acting by advance on prevention. Because the doctors, they used to wait for the patient. And you are a big doctor with a big disease. And if you want to be a, a big surgeon, give, you, give him a big wounded, a big casualty. This is not fair. We have to act on prevention. So of course this is public opinion. And I'm going to Jacques Lemoyne, évidemment giving money to Burundi, this is not popular, but you have to explain to the people, it will come. So prevention, with my good friend, uh, one of my Prime Minister, Michel Rocard, in the European Parliament, we try to set up an early warning system with all uh, very scientific, the price of the tomatoes and the, the human rights attempt and uh, etc. and uh, the religious, uh, uh, the extremism, etc. to set up but this is absolutely not useful. Just read the paper. You know where it is going to be dangerous. But determination, Jack is completely right. Unfortunately, we are interested in bad news. We are all react not only the politician, we are reacting to the bad news in the front pages and to the image on the TV. And don't imagine that, imagine that uh, if the, 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 the image disappeared, the problem has disappeared. But people are believing that this is true. So we have to change all that, going to prevention. Otherwise, it will be always too late. This is very good, the tribunal, international tribunal, but it comes after the murder, too late. Of course, we have to, to arrest Karacic and the, the old uh, 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 Salo. <laughs> Salo is a French term. Rubbish. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is just the beginning of an international consciousness. The, the point is, I, we don't, I don't see how it, it, it's going to happen. I believe he and I agree. It should be done. Uh, that's why nations act unilaterally. That's why some nations say, if you're not willing to help me deal with this problem, I'll do it myself. And there are very few nations that can actually do that. French, British, US, and others that have the means, global logistics, et cetera, et cetera, to do that. I'm going to say, I'm going to be very brief, and, and I hope to reinforce what Bernard has said. 
every great change in human history and culture has been impossible. Yeah, everyone. A, you know, Monticello, the White House, the U.S. Congress, and Mount Vernon were built by slaves. And when I grew up in North Florida, for part of my life, I went to an integrated. I went to the first integrated school in, the, in an incredibly segregated city, and I remember exactly how that was impossible. All these things are not possible until they happen, and people give a damn. A, the fact that, as Bernard has said, the idea of a humanitarian crisis and humanitarian intervention is being discussed now is one of the reasons that East Timor happened. Because had it not been the world that we're in today, Indonesia would still be running East Timor. It's because people looked at it and said, we're not going to let this continue when the first massacre happened. We're going to stop it. But it means that people like you, if you give a damn, and I assume you do, and people like him, who clearly does give a damn, and I can't give too much of a damn because I actually work for the UN, unlike these guys who are part-time employees, I'm a bit fired. Have, to keep, have to keep pushing on this issue or it won't change. I don't agree, a, and I don't think he does either. He's just making a point that this national sovereignty, uh, sacredness, is going to remain forever. Clearly it's no. not. We're in the middle of transition. He's it's talking about our new consciousness. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It may not happen in 50 years, but I predict it will happen within 100. You have your mic now? Yes. I'm Adriana Dakin, studying international security and negotiation here. I have a question for Mr. Lemoyne. Through Guatemala's former national security advisor, Jose Maria Argueta, I um, heard that you observed, thanks, a conflict resolution program in Guatemala called Centro Esta and probably Centro Demos in El Salvador. And the depth of what participants were discovering pleasantly surprised you, he indicated. Can you reveal ideas you've gathered on what effective programs should do to increase civic engagement in problem solving, in um, building, in opportunity increasing social networks, and getting practice in conflict resolution? Thank you. Those were both, I mean, exactly as Jacques Klein said, the successes disappear. Those were both successes. And the reason they were successes is that <clears throat> local army officers, who were thoughtful, businessmen who were thoughtful, people like Argueta, political people who were thoughtful, uh, were able to come together under an umbrella of the UN and NGOs to begin meeting to talk about common problems in the country. And because those different sectors were willing to talk about what are we going to do about population growth or employment or water purity rather than what are we going to do about who disarms, and we have to do it together because it's our country, those became seeds for discussing all the other issues that really mattered. So one, you have to create those spaces for these sectors to come together, and a smart way to do it is not put the most controversial issue on the table first. Take the Serbians and the, and the Muslims and the Croats together and say, who has water rights? Maybe that is the most controversial issue. Uh, who, who is going to have grazing rights? Talk about something that concerns all of them and is not who killed whom. They'll get to who killed whom eventually, I can guarantee it. Uh, number two, um, it takes a lot of hands-on work. We had to go out and identify each of those people and bring them in. Those were successes. I did something similar uh, in, a, in a less public way in Bosnia and in Northern Ireland, and they weren't successes. We brought people together in a similar way early on, and they hated each other. And they, in, in the meeting, they truly hated each other more. Indeed, at one moment with the Bosnians, I'll never forget it because I'm so flushed with those experiences in Salvador and Guatemala that I thought, oh, we're going to build a little bit of peace here. And one of the Bosnian Muslims looked at us after two days of these sort of thoughtful, touchy-feely talks together on how we're going to build consensus. He said, I feel like a Jew in Warsaw. And you bastards are asking me to sit down and cut a deal with the Gestapo. I'm not ready to do it. One has to respect that, too. Let's go up to the bleachers. Hi, my name is Rob Giortega, second year MPA. Um, the question I have is with regards to propaganda. Um, and I was wondering if you can tell me what roles um, journalists can play in this, and if it's vital in that sense, or is there something else that's been on brewing or as far as the UN goes? Are they thinking of other things? Because I know there's huge development on that, and I'd be curious to hear your viewpoints on that. Um, media plays a key role, obviously, and I've made it a point in every one of my missions to immediately establish radio and television, because I think what people are looking for is objective news. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, the newspapers are totally fraudulent. I can plant any story in any paper for 500 Deutsche Mark. Uh, so they have no credibility. The 62 radio stations, the same way. It's ethnic hatred, uh, it's revenge, it's all those things. So I think the local population tends to look to you, if you're credible, for a daily news program 
that takes the best of Euronews, BBC, CNN, and everyone else, and tells them what's really going on. Now, you can't ever lie, you can't ever obfuscate, you can't do any of those things. Objective news, even when your own people do something wrong. One of your people runs over a child, that's news, it's broadcast. And then gradually you win acceptance because they do not trust their own media. It's just too ethically biased. And indeed, even with the major stringers, AP, UPI, and the others, they use locals. And what they don't understand in New York or in Washington or elsewhere, that those locals also have ethnic biases. And I've monitored those stories coming out of Sarajevo. And I can always tell you if this was a news conference, by the way, you asked me the question, what ethnic group you are, and even within that ethnic group, what political spectrum you have. That's how callous the whole process has become. So objective reporting is essential. But we have donor fatigue, compassion fatigue, political fatigue. Bosnia has to go and is no longer of any great interest to anyone. What Bernard said before was absolutely right. I was back in France about six weeks ago visiting some of my cousins. Jacques, you're still in Sarajevo? Well, yes. You're still with the UN? Yes. Excellent. Now let's talk about the EU, Le Pen, the elections, unemployment, etc. No one gives a damn. Because it's quiescent. And that's really one of the challenges I think we always face. Excuse me to interrupt for a second, but one point I just wanted to clarify or, or know a little bit more about was the laws stating for the journalists, do they ha will they abide, every country that is, even if they're not within the UN, will they allow them the freedom to write upon whatever it is they want to write upon, or do they not have that freedom because... It's total. It's scathological at times, what they write about each other. You would not believe. I could show you magazines from Bosnia as the government that would shock you as almost semi-pornography. So there is freedom of the press. No one's ever hindered them on what they can write. The tragedy is that it is so vicious, so ethically biased, so nationalistic. Up there. Next question. My name is Reka Balu. I'm at the Education School and wanted to pick up on the the point that uh, Mr. Kushner raised about national interests and conflicts. I've been somewhat troubled at the growing economic, uh, not only interests, but um, sort of forces that have propelled a number of these civil conflicts throughout the world. And I'm wondering, despite the constraints within the UN that you guys have described today, is there any capacity for the UN to address what some of those economic interests are and to some extent diffuse them? And is there a role for other international bodies to do that as well? And I'm not talking just about multinational companies, but also the local economic interests that often seem to be fueling and sustaining some of these civil conflicts. Well, talking about the development and, and, sorry. Okay, if I understand well. Uh, you're asking me a question about the economy of the world and the development and the poverty of this particular nation. Am I right or not? Well, much more about the whole greed and grievance idea that there, is, there are reasons, economic reasons that allow economic. war to continue and... Economic reasons? Greed-driven as opposed greed. to grievance-driven conflict. Diamond, uh, petrol. Blood diamonds, etc. Yes, but not everywhere. By, okay, this is of course uh, an explanation and which is certainly advanced by a lot of uh, journalists uh, and everywhere. It exists, but it didn't exist in Kosovo. Kosovo it was the poorest country of the world, and there was no oil and no diamonds and nothing. Don't believe that all this crisis or confrontation in the world are caused or based on an economy. Yes, partly yes. It happens very frequently, but it is not enough. It is worse. Don't be so optimist on human beings. Hatred is coming in between groups like in Bosnia. My dear, in Bosnia, this is not a rich part of the world. But they were, because of the history, because of the invasion, because of the role of religion, they were absolutely confronted to each other. So, partly because I, I sound that the question was also uh, about the development. We have to, and this is an additional burden, of course, we have to set up and to develop a more fair, balanced economy in the world. Certainly, yes. And so, a peacekeeping mission must be uh, certainly a complete peacekeeping mission, offering a future for the people and the, and, and the children of the people, the protagonists. And it goes to the economy of the mission and to the money. And when we, you, Jacques uh, 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 and all the panelists were talking about the Security Council asking for some bad or good reason to interfere somewhere, okay, but who is paying? That's a crucial and key point. 
without the money coming from the nation, that is to say coming from the citizen of the nation, not from the budget, the budget is not coming from the sky, in the nation is coming from the pocket of the people. You have to convince them. That's why this is so important. In Burundi, it's uneasy to find money for Burundi. This is easier to find money for Kosovo because this is close, because this is in the middle of Europe. And eventually, it re reminds you that in between Germany and France, the history of our war and confrontation is a history of decades, centuries and centuries of fight. So you have to take all that in account. And in fact, in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, of course, the diamonds and etc. were important used by other foreigners, not by the people themselves. In other words, a young chap is writing a book now on the disintegration of Yugoslavia. And his thesis, which is not 100% correct, is that the war in Yugoslavia had less to do with ethnicity and nationalism and religion than it had to do with party elites in all the republics seizing power and privatizing state enterprises for personal gain. The Milosevic's, the Tudjman, and the others. There's a lot of truth to that, actually. The second thing is, this is not an area where the concept of enlightened self-interest is understood. One of my professors, when I was in university, who had been an exile from fascism, an exile from communism, said to me, if you ever work in this part of the world, remember the old proverb which says, Branko was out in the field plowing his field. And his plow hits a little urn, and he picks it up, and he cleans it, and shines it, and the genie jumps out. and says, Branko, this is the luckiest day of your life. You may wish for anything in the world, and I will grant it immediately. And Branko says, anything? Yes. Well, then I want this, this, and this. And the genie says, Branko, that's all yours. You may wish for anything in the world, and I will grant it to you, with the understanding that your neighbor, Ivica, will have twice as much. He said, in that case, I want to be blinded in one eye. <laughs> Jim? Well, Bernard is right to say that there are many conflicts that are just based on human evil and hatred. But there are also many conflicts that are based on strong economic reasons. There's a compelling study by Paul Collier, the World Bank, which you probably know. It's quite convincing. A, it's unlikely that without diamonds and oil, Angola or Sierra Leone or Liberia would have the conflicts they have. And it's unlikely that other countries with, the, with drugs would have the conflicts without drugs, have the conflicts that they have. A, it's an incredibly important motor in some conflicts. The UN, if I'm not mistaken, I just flew in from Europe uh, last night today began to publicly um, name governments in Africa that they believe are deeply involved in some of these cases. Um, that's probably a good thing. In that last case, if I can just add, um, the countries that had agreed to withdraw their troops from the Democratic Republic of Congo, this is the latest UN report, have replaced those troops with criminal networks who do the job of extraction that the troops uh, performed before. So they're using surrogates, and essentially the same behavior has yeah, continued. So Over here. Yeah. yeah, good evening. I'm Karl Varandak, studying at Kennedy School in Master of Public Administration and in International Development. I'm a French student. And my question is, um, do you think that to raise, as you said, um, consciousness in the public uh, is enough or there is also a need to reform the decision stru structure of the UN body for three concerns. The first, to build up a prevention which is not only unilateral prevention escalating in half the world preventing against the other half. The second is to bring the spotlight in, in places which is not the spotlight of any nations. And the third, to bring a resolution yet adopted with a consensus to be as, as strongly adopted than others. Mm. Do you want to respond to that? No. <laughs> You're French. Yeah, well, uh, let, me, <laughs> let, let me be. He's a French guy, of course. We're all French. I love his accent. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, I'm not so sure. Of course, it should have been better to get, uh, uh, like you know, all the, the reforms of the, the UN system, where the reform of the Security Council, the, the vote, the majority, and the veto, etc. Et yes, but for the moment it works. And my answer is, don't break the system. Yes, uh, uh, Brazil and India and Germany and Japan were supposed to come in uh, as a member. Okay, but the problem is to give to the people 
this consciousness you were talking about. Because without the consciousness, even if you reform the system, the UN system, without money, without to unlight, how to unlight, without money and without self-determination and soldiers eventually, not to use the soldier, not to make war, but on the country to prevent the war. And with a sort of uh, 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 administrative body for everywhere. This is a huge battle, and it is our battle to change this model of, to change the image of globalization, which is so much negative now, now for the moment in the spirit of the people, and to transform it in a positive image. And just to give you an example, because I'm a doctor and I've spent a lot of time as a Minister of Health, we have the opportunity now not only to set up what we have done, doctor without borders, but now this is time to set up patients without borders. Yes, my dear. And it goes to the money, because we have the, re the resources in terms of drugs. But drugs are in the north and pa patients in the south. So this is for your generation, your task, your, your goal, your aim. You have to transform this. This is not possible, no longer possible to accept that in certain countries of Africa, people are dying at 40 years old, even less because of AIDS. And we are, in my country, dying around 83. This is not possible. Immigration is coming, of course, but this is not because we are so well uh, uh, well, uh, welcoming the people, certainly not, because this is the need of their family. We have to transform that. And it will give a, a sort of world consciousness after we'll transform the UN system. I'm not so sure to be right, because some reforms were apparently very good reforms, but we'll see. For the moment, if uh, it works like it works, it is not so bad. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say so. I'm not uh, uh, revolutionary <laughs> enough, according to my own opinion. But <laughs> Jim, you wanted to add uh, just briefly. I mean, it's a system that was created after the Second World War, as you're well aware, to create to really deal with conflicts between states and prevent them. It now deals mostly with conflicts within states. Uh, as Bernard has said, the whole human rights dimension is new given a, a much more interventionist slant. Um, I personally think it's going to go more gradually in the way that you're suggesting. But I agree with Bernard that if you pushed it too hard, you'd have a counter reaction, and it's not the way to go. And I would say the following, that um, there are really three UNs, and maybe more, but there are at least three. There's the Security Council, which has the veto, and ultimately will send troops and, and spend money. There's the General Assembly of all the nation state members, it has power as well. And there's the UN Charter, which at this point is not empowered. And the UN Charter does not say we the governments. It says we the peoples. And it was written in 1945 because governments have been so horrific to their citizens. And it was intentionally uh, written to discuss human rights and to discuss humanitarian action and to discuss development. And to me, a legitimate way within the institutions of the UN itself that are recognized by the Security Council is to talk about the Charter. And the last two Secretary Generals have begun to do that. Before the Cold War, Secretary Generals weren't allowed to talk at all. Uh, with luck, we'll get another good Secretary General. I think we have a great one now. And, um, and he'll continue to push these issues. Let's see but if you're right. Yes, you are right. Let's see if we can do another quick round over here. Hi, um, my name is Max Lauser. I'm a fellow at the Car Center for Human Rights Policy. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, but I've been working with the Médecins Sans Frontières for the last 10 years. So we're sort of colleagues by now. I don't know if my question is really to you directly. It's, it's probably to all three of you. But, and it's a so I'm sorry to hear that I cannot ask anything about Plan de Colombia. Uh, but since it has been mentioned by not being mentioned equally, Bernard, it's a pity that you don't not comment further on the Operation Turquoise at the time in, in Rwanda. But anyway, there is, I think, indeed, many things have been said here about the, the function of the special representative and the difficult task you have. But in view of this MSF experience or Doctors Without Borders experience and speaking out and creating public pressure, I think like 
and that's probably the topic of my research here as well, is how public pressure can respons create responsibility in the state. State sovereignty is at stake. And we can see that in the examples of the hypocrisy, say like how the world turns a blind eye on what happens in Chechnya, or uh, the way you describe indeed like uh, lots of attention goes to the Balkans, but uh, people forget about the Sudan, or Colombia indeed. There's so much money going in there. By the way, the, the report on uh, mineral resources in the Congo is already a year and a half old. So this is already known for a long, long time. Mm. I, would, uh, I would challenge your position by saying that, in fact, the Special Representative Secretary General is just there to uh, sort of represent the compromise of the United Nations, which is a, it's a conformist platform of agencies, rather than to, to say that it's a consensus of states. And the problem in here is the state sovereignty itself. Jacques Klein doesn't agree with you. No, I don't agree with you at all. I, don't, I, never, I never felt I was represent. Oh, I'm sorry. Did my microphone disappear? You're okay. I always felt I was res basically responding to basic decency uh, in my mission, regardless of what the occasional telegram from New York would be. I and my staff decided what was right to do, what was decent to do. Is what we're doing today in the interest of 85% of the people in this country? And we did it without worrying about it. In fact, I once said, I was supposed to operate under something called the Air Dude Agreement in Eastern Savonia, 14, 15 points. Someday when I write a book, I'll actually read that Air Dude Agreement. Mm. I'm not interested in Air Dude Agreement. I'm interested in, do these children have vitamins? Are they properly fed? Are we building institutions of law? In other words, are we doing what is right to do here? And with the limited resources I have, without worrying about this, will I be criticized? I could care less. I'll be out of a job anyhow in six months. You follow me? There's no pension system here. So you have a unique opportunity for once in your life to do what's right, without worrying about promotion or advancement, because there isn't any. Can I just, can you just no, we have to move along, please. We're, we're running an example out of time. on this. Uh, no, I'd like to hear Bernard on this. Really, it's like the last summer MSF was criticized of actually the uh, UN started to push on donor nations, donor, organiz donor governments, not to fund mid Central Frontier anymore because we were providing assistance to refugees that came out of unit areas. And the reason was that they wanted to pressurize the Angolan government to send a memorandum first. Mm -hmm. This is the way you see how aid is being actually manipulated. And this is what I really, I'd really like to have your no, That's a different issue. Well, I don't know. For me, it was the same fight in Médecins Sans Frontières and in the UN and in the government. For me, it was absolutely the same. But fortunately or unfortunately, with the success, people uh, become prof professional. And they don't want uh, we touch their pores. They have their field, like the politician. And uh, I disagree with that. And I disagree with my own people in Médecins Sans Frontières and Doctors of the World, they, they become too much, uh, let's say, sectarian. People to whom belong the suffering of the others? To everybody. Everybody, you can try to help. Only the victims have the right to refuse help. Only the victims, not the owners of the poor, the owners of the victims. And I'm very, very disappointed sometimes by the evolution of my own former organization. Because uh, when I was in Kosovo, and I'm very proud to have been in Kosovo and to help the Kosovar people, to the extent we were able to help, of course. Hmm? And I discovered a, a fantastic hatred, not in between the Serbs and the Kosovar, I was uh, aware about that, but in between the NGOs and the army, by example, I'm very sorry to say so. But the army, the people, uh, the soldiers, they are far in advance in comparison to the politician in terms of internationality, international human rights. Because they used to serve in the UN system. And they are part of, of, of it, in a way. I know about all the story, and I'm absolutely suspicious about it. And I know about Srebrenica, and I know about, of course, but you know, something is coming out, coming out from this particular engagement. Something like we used to say, when I was a leftist, and I'm still a leftist, the name was internationalism. And now we say globalization, but this is the same fight. 
they receive money or not receive money. Angola, Angola, when Médecins Sans Frontières start uh, his last campaign, it was better because of the peace. So they, was, they had access to the poor people starving. And so the, 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 the speed of the help coming to these people was better than before, etc. You know, <laughs> this is a sort of condominium. Let's talk about NGOs, that's important. Remember what we talked about earlier? NGOs? Yeah, I think this is an important point, you see. When we're out there running missions, we need all the help we can get. And as, uh, as he and I know, we have great regard for the NGO community. We know who the good ones are. You know, the CARE, the Norwegian's People's Aid, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Manières, of Pontier, all these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I'm uh, sorry, for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 we also know, and I divide them into thirds. One third I found are people out there with a fax machine and a telephone raising money to keep themselves employed. That's the sad truth. One third are very well-meaning, but hopelessly naive. So in Rwanda, when we were doing Rwanda, we had a situation where we were trying to bring in water purification equipment, because the issue there was dehydration. We had a C5 circling with water purification equipment from Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and we had a 707 sitting on the uh, runway, unloading secondhand clothes and canned goods from around the world. Totally useless, of no help whatsoever. And we finally had to say, move it or we'll blow it up because we need that water purification equipment. So one-third self-serving, one-third well-meaning, but don't have their act together. And then the one-third who are really good. But the system doesn't police itself. I can't ask anyone, when I go to a new mission, give me a list of the 20 best NGOs, people who deliver. So when I need vitamin for every child in Eastern Savonia between the ages of 5 and 15, Norwegian People's Aid comes through. Who are they? And I would like them at some point to police themselves. Tell me who the good ones are, because we have war groupies who show up at every crisis. Sorry, it was full of little people with rucksacks who want to be part of the crises and chaos and murder and mayhem. That's a very dangerous trend in a way, and they follow these things around the world. When we desperately need the quality NGOs who really have the ability to bring something to bear to help us do our task. We've run out of time. I've got to <coughs> one more quick question. Okay, thank you. My name is Marisa Jolson, and I'm an MPA candidate first year, and I was actually in Bosnia this summer. And I had a question for all of you, actually, which I appreciate that you talked about the, the 1990s and the tangible challenges of the UN kind of coming to the, have the responsibility to peacekeep. So I wanted to know what kind of resolve or lessons you feel that the UN has tangibly learned from the experience, how they might change later as far as having quicker responses, more, less amorphous resolutions, or how much really there's a structural issue at the UN that, say in the Security Council, there are going to be national interests, and right. how much do bilateral interests between countries actually, are those just going to dominate even if there's goodwill? Right. Let's go back to how we started. Remember what I said. It's not the UN. There is no such thing. It is the Security Council that gives us a mandate and says, this is what we want you to do. And now we have to find the resources and decide how quickly we can implement that. That's the issue. So you're, you're actually talking to the wrong people. We're basically the ones who carry out the surgery. But you have to define what it is you want us to do. And that's the Security Council, over which we have no control whatsoever. And the General Assembly is. And so, but do you see that there's been any sea of change as far as the, the mentality of the members themselves? I mean, has it become any easier at all, or do you see, I mean, or is it just going to keep continuing? You've all suggested that there's a process of evolution going on. Yes. yes. Um, would, you, would you care to sort of sum up very quickly where, where you see it going and how rapidly you see it getting? Well, I don't know the exact number, but uh, you have uh, around 45,000. Uh, no, you have a, uh, just a few blue helmets, real blue, hel blue helmets, some, some hundred. Uh, that is to say, under the auspices of the UN, with the blue barrettes, etc. But you have, and this is certainly the perspective, uh, more than uh, uh, 60 to 80 uh, thousand uh, soldiers, NATO, uh, OUA, etc. So now it goes to a certain part delivered to the region, certainly, to act as a military action. But for the rest, I don't know, because I don't know. We'll certainly develop 
more mission than before. And now there is a lot of mission going together, huh? implemented by the Security Council or the General Assembly. The problem another time is money. How can I answer to such a question? I know that my country is certainly one of the worst contributor to the UN nations uh, system globally. You have to convince the people to give more. Part of the budget must be devoted, part of the national budget must be devoted to peace operation or particularly to some ag UN agencies, etc. And this is very difficult for the people because they always believe that uh, you have for first before everything to develop your concern on your neighbor and not to the rest of the world. So you know the development, uh, we, we, we sang some 10 years ago and uh, we were absolutely sure five years ago that we had to, to devote 0.7 part of the natural budget for the, 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 the international development. It has not been done in my country and we are the, uh, a, a top, the top model of Europe. This is uh, 0.3 something and not seven. So this is very difficult because of non-employment, because of, uh, we cannot be out of the reality. The reality in a country is that we are concerned by our families. And uh, generosity and solidarity and uh, fraternity and etc. are not empty words. But we have to base our concern on these particular words and to, 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 to set up more, this is not, no longer an imagination, to set up a new adventure for the youth. To change the world, in another way. Jim, you're yeah. coming up. <clears throat> to answer your question, uh, unquestionably, what my colleagues have said about the Security Council and the role of nation states and their own interests, that's just the reality. That's not going to change quickly. But two things have changed. Uh, one, you can embarrass states more easily than you could before, and you can mobilize public opinion more easily than you could before, particularly on their grotesque violations of human rights. That's an advance. And secondly, in the 13 years since 1989, when the UN has been asked to engage in, Professor Reggie will know better than I, but I think over 40 uh, interventions of different types, the UN has gotten better at it. Uh, I mean, DBKO, Peacekeeping Department, is a real department now with real experts in issues that we're always going to have to face. It had nobody before, really. DPA is overly weak. The UN system works together as a system the way it never did before. It can do a lot better, but it does. Those are advances uh, under pressure. Um, a lot more to do. I want to answer the uh, gentleman from Holland. What is your name? Max. I think that you asked uh, a powerfully pointed, and uh, I don't really want to answer a question, and I'll just try to answer it in this way. Um, there are, I think, 21 representatives of the Secretary General in the world today. In most conflicts in the world, there isn't anybody uh, appointed by the UN. Like any major public job, it forces one to balance uh, responsibility and, frankly, the honor and public trust that we're given with a pragmatic political instinct to do our best to get a crisis resolved. And like any public job of that sort, an SRSG is going to face a moment, if it gets difficult, when he or she is going to have to balance. Should I stay and continue to swallow hard and deal with these murderers and these corrupt people and these state members who don't care because I believe that by leaving I'll do more damage than by staying? Or should I resign and denounce it? Because it's finally reached a point where if I don't, I can't stomach it, and I'm actually harming the interests that I'm here mandated to carry out. It's possible that too few SRSGs in the last decade have resigned. And there are a couple of conflicts where, had they done so, perhaps it would have mobilized public opinion and international attention in a way that staying did not. But it's a damn, damn hard decision to take and balance the strike. We're not purists. On the other hand, we're mandated to carry out very large ideals. And probably sometimes we get it wrong. Jacques, final word from you. 
I would say I would ask all of you to stay engaged through United Nations organizations, through obviously your studies, etc. What we need to harness here is world public opinion and the media. That ultimately helps us do our job. Because we know in the Security Council there are always national interests. You quite often in these situations, as you well know, come up with the lowest common denominator, what is ultimately acceptable to the totality of the Council. Uh, but you have an enormous gravitas, and I think it's underestimated at times, the role the media plays, the role NGOs plays, the role academia plays in critical articles and what have you. And maybe working together, you know, we build a kind of consensus that gives us the mandate, and I keep going back to that. Without that mandate, which tells you what you're authorized to do, your hands are tied. But once the council gives you the mandate, then we have a fair room to play. The mandate to me has always been the floor and never the ceiling. And if they don't like what I'm doing, they can fire me. That's fine. But until that time, I will try to do what I think is right. Thank you. Jacques Klein, Bernard Kouchner, uh, Jim Lemoyne, on behalf of all of us here at the Kennedy School, thank you so much for sharing with us your wisdom. Thank <laughs> you.